My name is Maggie. I'm with Lupus LA. I'm the virtual care coordinator. Welcome everyone tonight to our wonderful web webinar. Looking forward to getting started in just a few moments. Just going to give uh, folks a few more, you know, a minute or two to, to join in. Feel free to let us know where you're coming in from. Put it in the chat, the Q&A. We'd love to know where everyone is joining us from. And if this is your first time joining us on a webinar, always love to know how folks are finding our community. Ah, Louisiana, hello. Torrance, the Valley, go Valley. I'm a Valley girl, so <laughs> I, I, I grew up in the Valley. <laughs> it is hot out here, that's true. Hi, Ruth. Okay. I think I'll just give it maybe a couple more minutes just because I know sometimes logging on <laughs> Wi-Fi, things like that. So I'd love to give people some extra time to get situated. We have Cerritos in the house. <laughs> Just welcoming everyone in and hoping everyone is able to log in without any trouble, can hear us all. We're just giving people an extra moment or two before we get started. Hello from Encino. <laughs> Okay, I think we're gonna go ahead and just do some brief introductions, okay? Um, welcome everyone, my name is Maggie and I am the virtual care coordinator here at Lupus LA. Really glad to be with you here tonight um, to 
head off um, our discussion on the benefits of joining a support group. We have a wonderful group of panelists and um, a wonderful moderator who are all near and dear to Lupus LA. Um, but before we get started, I'm going to um, ask one of our panelists, Estela Mata, to share with you a unique feature that we have available today. Hola, buenas noches a todos y bienvenidos a la presentación que está siendo aquí presentada por Lupus LA. Este, esta transmisión será transmitida en español también simultáneamente. Y si está usando un teléfono inteligente, por favor vaya a, este, a los controles de la junta y, y oprima los tres puntos y seleccione el lenguaje español. Si está usando una computadora, también va a poder escuchar esta transmisión en español y vaya abajo a donde dice interpretación y está un mundo y allí va a seleccionar español. Así va a poder escuchar toda esta transmisión en español. Gracias. Okay, thank you so much. We're going to just give people a moment to transition to utilizing that uh, live interpretation option. Uh, okay. <laughs> Rob, um, feel free to um, type questions in the chat or in the Q&A, and we will be leaving some time at the end for that. And um, what we're hoping is just for an ongoing discussion and interactive set session today. So um, I'm going to welcome our moderator for tonight's discussion, Dr. Monica Blind, and she will share a little bit about herself and her connection here to Lupus LA. And then we will introduce our uh, each of our panelists who are also our wonderful skilled group facilitators. So you may recognize everyone here in the room and uh, looking forward to getting started. So Dr. Blight, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, Lupus LA. Thank you, my esteemed co-panelist, Liz, Juana, and Estela. I am Dr. Monica Blyde. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist in Southern California and the owner of Faces of Health Wellness Center. I am also the creator of My Health in My Hands app, which is a mental health, stress management, and pain management app that will be released later this month and online master class. So um, a little bit about me. I have been living with lupus since 2012 diagnosed first with lupus and later also with fibromyalgia because when you have chronic illnesses, you can't have just one. It's normally multiple. Um, and so I, I uh, approach this talk and my professional work um, with the lens of both the patient and professional. So lived experience plus the um, professional expertise of um, being an uh, expert in the, the mind-body health connection and in clinical psychology. So welcome everyone. Um, as Maggie said, please do put your questions in the chat as we're going along. I'm going to start by sharing a little bit of research behind the benefits of a supports group. And then my esteemed co-panelists are going to share um, additional information. And we have a series of questions that were pre-submitted to um, run through about this particular topic. So I think if we just say the word support group, you know, think about for yourself what comes to mind. I think most often in the media, what's popularized is like AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, or that kind of support group where you have, you know, um, six men usually sitting around and in, in, uh, in chairs in a circle. And then there's like some coffee and donuts on a side table. And then they're talking about like, you know, hello, my name is XYZ and this is my, um, my issue. Support groups, span so far beyond that. And I'm really excited for the panelists to share all the um, support groups that Lupus LA has available, including those which are virtual, where you don't have to be in a uh, physical seat, but you can still achieve um, or um, be able to get the benefits. 
So just kind of expand your thinking before we even start on what is a support group. But think about an environment, a place where you're getting information and you're getting support. So you're getting some sort of help, whether that be with medical advice or psychological advice on boosting your mood or just in general on how to manage your lupus. And why is this good for us? There have been literally thousands of studies um, about this particular topic. And, and when you go to Google Scholar, for example, and you just type in social support and health, there are over 600,000 articles that come up on this particular topic, including some that are specific to lupus. And so what it's shown is that there are um, a couple different theories that um, are underlying why support groups are so beneficial. One is the buffer theory and the second is the attachment theory. I'm going to talk about both in addition to what are the, the neural or the brain networks that are actually involved in producing those benefits of social support. Buffer theory. Um, support groups help to buffer or protect us from multiple things including number one, isolation and loneliness. So that we don't feel alone in what we're going through, what we're struggling with or trying to navigate making sense of this illness, whether you have been first diagnosed and you're trying to make sense of how do I adjust to my life or you've had this um, illness for you know, 11 years like me or 20 years or longer like Juana. And you're like, okay, I've gotten this new lab result. You know, what do I do now? You know, so eliminating some of that, that isolation and loneliness. And, and what one study showed is with lupus in particular, because it is an invisible illness, their um, lupus patients are even more prone to feeling invisible to social ties. It's not like you can walk down the street and, you know, if you were to um, meet the assistance of a wheelchair, you can see another wheelchair user like, hey, you know, you're, you're, you're my people versus you would never know if I was walking down the street unless I'm having a bad pain day that I was living with lupus. You would never know that, you know, um, one in, um, can't remember the statistic, but there's over uh, 2 million people in the United States alone living with lupus. There are um, over 1 billion people worldwide living with chronic illnesses. And a majority of those are invisible. So buffering us from that, helping us to feel understood and validated and not alone. And most importantly, in my opinion, helping to have hope. So when I was first diagnosed in 2012, I actually went to the Looms for Lupus group that was hosted by um, Estella and Juana, and I was so afraid. I didn't know what to do at that time. I was a divorced single mom. I was like, what the heck? All that I knew was from my own internet research, which said that this disease was um, debilitating, chronic, progressive. I, I read a book about someone who had lupus and she lost the ability to walk. And so of course my anxious mind says, oh no, I'm not gonna be able to walk in all these things. Went to Estella and Juana's group, the Looms for Lupus. And not only was I able to be around other people who understood, but I got um, to be around people who had had this disease for decades and they were still alive, first of all. <laughs> but then they were also doing fine. And so to have that hope, establishing that is so important. When we talk about the attachment theory, having social support, having that connection and community is so important. And what that does is it helps to reduce the negative impact of low health literacy. Meaning if we don't know how to manage our illness, we're not going to. And so what the research shows is that having the, um, the, the access to information and access to education is going to help us, but then it's also going to provide us accountability. Like, hey, you've been taking your meds? Or hey, have you, you know, went to follow up with your doctor or uh, whatever the case might be? That's going to help so much. It's also going to reduce anxiety, depression, and medical trauma. 
which is something that we don't talk enough about, which is what happens when we go to a physician and Juana can share her testimony, can still share her story for you know five years, 10 years and saying like, hey, this is what's going on with me and being gaslit. Like, well, are you sure you aren't just making it up? Actually, let me send you to psych for an eval, you know, because I'm not seeing anything going on. And for one, I'm gonna, you know, go ahead and share a little bit, but she had, you know, lost, I think it was a, a lung. She had, a lung was collapsed before they were like, oh, oh, I guess you're right. You know, so to, to not experience that medical trauma, to have other people around you or, who are like, hey, actually you're not getting the standard of care that you should. And here's my doctor or here's this, this tool or this equipment that I'm using or these skills that I use. And to also give you information on when to get extra help. The beautiful thing is that the, the brain benefits, the neural networks that are involved actually show that there's a two-way relationship, a two-way benefits for attending a support group where uh, there's the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access um, which involves uh, specific parts of our brain, the ventral striatum and septum, septal area. And that is associated with actually giving support where we experience less inflammation in our body and reduced stress when we're giving support. So you veterans, in the in the uh, the lupus you know club community as spoonies don't stop going just because you've gotten what you need you need because the next generation also needs your giving and your brain is going to benefit and for us who are receiving the support there's um, less activation in the amygdala or the sympathetic nervous system which also is associated with lower stress less inflammation and better overall health. So I'm, I'm telling you the psychological benefits and also the medical and the physiological benefits for why you need to be in a support group, okay? But our panelists will tell you so much more. First, I'm going to uh, go ahead and, and hand it off to Estella, um, who's going to uh, share with us a little bit. I mean, I've, I've given you guys like the best promo already. <laughs> <laughs> kind of stolen your thunder a little bit, but I know. With more information. <laughs> no, it's, it's so great. You know, it's going back, um, just to doing a brief, uh, a brief introduction of myself, and then we'll touch a little bit on really how we connected 12, over 12 years ago. Um, hi everyone, my name is Estela Mata. I'm one of the co-founders of Looms for Lupus and we're a nonprofit organization that supports those living with lupus in overlapping conditions such as fibromyalgia, including mental health. We support not just the individual, we support the loved ones and caregivers, which I think is so very important when it comes to providing support. And our support group is a bit unique. Um, we incorporate, we have actually a licensed clinical therapist on site and, you know, she's, she's actually tuned in. So shout out to uh, Ruth Padilla King. Um, she has been uh, facilitating along uh, my sister Juana and I, I do not have lupus. I do have, uh, was diagnosed with fibromyalgia. Uh, but a lot of the things that we incorporate is the support and awareness about what is support to the individual and what is the, or how can we, the caregivers support those living with uh, lupus. And, you know, it's just been really amazing to be able to incorporate a lot of the, you know, different modalities besides education, besides awareness, besides uh, learning about the condition, but also learning how to communicate with one another, how to listen, how to empathize, how to support and how to take uh, back that life that you had before uh, you were diagnosed and continue to thrive despite the condition because living with lupus or a chronic condition an invisible illness, you know, can take a toll on you, not only physically, but emotionally. And it is so very important to know that that is just a part of you. That is not all of you. You are way more than just your condition. So yes, we incorporate a little bit of everything. And like Dr. Blythe was saying, you know, she came to our support group and, you know, we work together and it was, you know, after this and after her coming and joining, she got to be able to see a couple of people. One of the first things that 
in our first support groups is we had someone that had been living with lupus for over 30 years. And just when she shared that, we all like, it was like a, a big sigh of relief saying, wow, she's alive and it's been 30 years. There is hope. And one of the things that we started doing was incorporating a lot of art therapy and knitting was one of the things that helped Juana. So we continue and we did start with knitting a community of hope and we continue to do that. Even though we don't knit every day, we do incorporate a lot of art therapy. So that's a little bit of the support group that we, we handle. We actually facilitate two support groups. One of them is the one with, that includes caregivers and it's bilingual. And then one specifically in Spanish for Spanish um, speakers. So I'll hand it off to Juana. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Juana Mata. I am one of the co-founders of Looms for Lupus. I am someone living with lupus, but I am, I am definitely more than just a lupus patient. I am a social worker and a healthcare advocate. My journey, my journey as a healthcare advocate started after I was diagnosed with lupus in 2009. Um, after my diagnosis and not knowing what lupus was and learning about what it was and how it was impacting my body, I realized that part of my mission in this world was not only to support those living with lupus and overlapping conditions such as fibromyalgia and mental health, but also to support those uh, living with lupus uh, and their family members, loved ones, and their caregivers. So for me, it was important to really do what I'm passionate about. And that's exactly what I'm doing. I facilitate an English support group with Estella and every second Saturday of the month at 9.30. And we also do the support group in Spanish on Sundays, every second Sunday of the month in Spanish. And again, those support groups are not only for the patient living with lupus, but also for their loved ones, caregivers, or any family member that wants to learn how to support and wants to learn about how lupus affects us living with lupus. And I'll hand it to Ms. Liz. Awesome. Thanks guys. I, you know, I was just reflecting. I love being in these groups with Estella and Juana because when we were planning for this group, we were talking about that we have known each other for like 13 years now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we met um, actually while I was facilitating um, our children's hospital, Los Angeles, families living with rheumatic disease group. And we like automatically found each other. <laughs> and it is so nice to know that we're still a family. So we are not you know, newbies to Lupus LA. We are people that recognize that Lupus LA has a mission and we believe in that mission. And we're gonna to work together as advocates to help all of the lupus patients, their families and our community. But like Dr. Blyde was saying, we definitely get something out of this. So it's so awesome to continue to feed off each other's energy after all these years later. Um, it's just, it's really fun. I think that that's really meaningful and says a lot about the work um, that we're doing. So my name is Liz. Um, I was diagnosed with lupus um, 21 years ago. Um, I was diagnosed originally with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and I thought, what 16 year old has rheumatoid arthritis? Um, I was actually living right outside New York City at, at the time. And my friend and I went to, to Magnolia Bakery to get some cupcakes one weekend. And we were walking down the street and I was struggling. I was a competitive swimmer. And the week before, you know, had won races, was practicing four hours a day. And that day, I could not do our normal walk. And it was not because of all the cupcakes I ate, but it probably was contributing. And I said to my friends, it feels like I have, or feels like I have arthritis. And we laughed about it until that next week when I was completely debilitated and was being carried into my primary care provider's uh, office by my dad. 
So the rheumatoid arthritis diagnosis in itself was so challenging for my family to wrap our head around. And it continued to decline, unfortunately. So like, you know, like we were talking about with fibromyalgia and lupus, Dr. Blyde, you were mentioning, you know, lupus as it comes with all these other things, right? Um, of course, we had to, you know, put the icing on the cake with a lupus diagnosis about two months later, um, which was actually a relief for me because we literally could not figure out what was going on. There was a lot of gaslighting, like you're 16, you're depressed, you're anxious, um, you know, you're a teenager. What else are you to expect? Your attention is seeking. We get that a lot with pain, right? I bet some of you guys are nodding. Like, yes, when we're saying we're in pain, I think especially as women, we sometimes don't get taken very seriously. Um, and so it became really, really severe. But what I didn't do at the time was seek support. I was too cool for school. I was like this punk rock girl. I thought it was too cool to talk to other people with lupus. I didn't know anyone else with lupus. I didn't think, and my family either, didn't think that people my age had diseases like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. It felt so, so isolating. So as I got older, I started to engage with groups on the East Coast um, that were involved in arthritis um, advocacy you know, a walk or an educational session um, or a camp for teens um, and eventually got connected with what now is LRA um, and started doing more advocacy work um, and education work. Um, I then decided that this is my mission. This is my heart. I have been navigating the health system since I was 16 years old. And I want to use my experience, similar to Dr. Blyde, I want to use my experience as a patient to, to really be able to advocate for other people that have not had to advocate this system yet. Because it was challenging enough for me and my family who were middle class, we had some resources, but it was challenging enough for us to navigate that I could not even at a young age imagine what this looked like for people who were not English speaking who you know, had low health literacy, so maybe having some hard time understanding um, the words that, that were being talked about, the words that are being said in a doctor's appointment, figuring out what that means for them, understanding what's being told to them at medical appointments. So that navigation, that's what I had kind of perfected, and I really wanted to be able to help others be able to navigate too. So I um, got my master's in social welfare from UCLA with a specialization in, um, in systems, in communities, because I really wanted to be an advocate. I have a loud mouth. Anybody who knows me will tell you, you can hear me from down the hallway. And I really wanted to use that. I wanted to use all the strengths, and the foundation that I had built as a patient. Um, and I became a medical social worker. So my job, I work at UCLA as a social worker. Um, before that, I worked at Children's Hospital Los Angeles as a social worker. Um, and almost immediately in my job at um, Children's Hospital, um, I was actually asked by Maggie if I was interested in facilitating one of the groups for the families living with rheumatic diseases support group. Um, eventually, I became lead facilitator of that group. Um, and did that group, my gosh, probably for 10 years. And that's where I met Estella um, and Juana. And um, from that, I got more connected with Lupus LA because I saw the incredible work that they were doing for the community and started doing um, the adult support groups for Lupus LA. So I've been doing these groups for 10 years and I'm still here. And I think part of that, like Dr. Blyde was saying, is that we get something back. We get energy back. So I don't have a lot of energy to give because my body is attacking itself. So I have to be mindful literally of what energy I'm giving because I don't have a lot, but I have found a job, a profession, a passion that fills me back up in a way that's meaningful so that I can be loud, that I can be in your face. That's me. I'm a Jersey girl. I don't, I don't, that's my excuse. Um, but so now um, the two groups that I facilitate with Lucas LA is one of our adult support groups. Actually, it's the first Tuesday of the month, so that'll be tomorrow. Um, 
And I also do our young adult group, which is so exciting. We recognized at Lupus LA that this was missing. We had an amazing program for kids and their families living with rheumatic diseases. It was incredible. There was amazing adult support groups, incredible groups like Lupus for Lupus, our other adult support groups where people felt connected, validated, that they felt heard. There was nothing in between. So there were tons of teens and young adults that I was working with in the children's group who were saying, I don't feel like I'm old enough for some of the adult groups. And I'm too old to go to the children's groups. And I'm dealing with things like relationships, with concerns around having children, going to college, um, you know, just navigating being, you know, navigating the challenges of being a young adult. Um, and so we decided this year that we were going to try out our young adult support group, which is for ages 21 to 35. And it has been a huge hit. And it's a hit, I think, too, because I've been there. I was that person at that age who was navigating all of these things. So again, I too am able to meld the patient side of me and the professional side of me as a, as a licensed clinical social worker and put that together to be able to, in my job, advocate for patients and their families in, at UCLA Medical Center. And then in the group, be able to um, facilitate incredible change, incredible validation, incredible relationships within the support group. So I'm just continued to be excited about what we do. And I love doing it with who I consider my family, which is Lupus LA. I love that, Liz. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so we're going to start the Q&A portion of our um, panel. And we have some questions that were pre-prepared or um, pre-submitted, but I want to address the questions that are in the chat and then go back to the questions that we have pre-prepared. So we have some questions, um, including someone asked, um, are isolation and wanting to be alone symptoms of anxiety or depression? Um, I'll, I'll answer that and, and Liz, please um, hop in as well. So typically, um, um, isolation, um, not doing the things that you would normally do or not finding pleasure in the things that you normally find pleasure in, those are all symptoms of depression. Um, but if you do um, wonder if my depression, is it like just sadness or stress, or is it like a clinical depression, then you can definitely like see a professional to get additional support from that. But something to kind of keep in mind with anxiety or depression is, is it something that um, happens like you're having a bad moment in the day or a bad day or two, or is it something that has been lasting for, you know, at least two weeks? And so that's the criteria for a major depressive disorder where you can't really lift yourself out of that fog. And of course that can be caused by, you know, um, situations such as living with lupus, living with different, you know, diseases and having the stress of your kids and your partner or bills and those kinds of things. But it's also, there's also a biological component as well. Too little serotonin, um, poor gut health, um, too little dopamine and those are things that can be addressed through therapy and medication. Um, is there something you wanted to add with uh, to that, Liz or Estella or Juana? Yeah, I just, I wanted to add that it's okay to want to be by yourself. And sometimes my friends or family, I have some who are kind of like, almost like overprotective if I want to be by myself. And I think that, that it's really important what Dr. Blyde was saying about kind of telling the difference and knowing the differences in that because sometimes I don't have energy to give to other people and I have to refuel. Like I have to step back, pay attention to myself, get some rest, and it is too much energy to have to engage with someone all the time, to talk with someone. Like honestly, sometimes I'm too tired to talk to someone. And so being alone is what I need. And I feel really empowered in being able to have the insight and knowledge that that's something I need. 
But certainly if you're feeling like you are feeling you like Dr. Bly was mentioning like sadness, lack of motivation and what you were once feeling, um, maybe lack of energy. Um, and let's be real. Some of our medications can cause depressive symptoms. Right. So steroids, for example, steroids can really affect your mood. You don't want to ask my husband what it's like in our house when I'm on a high dose of steroids. It is chaos. It is chaos and bleach. The whole house is bleach. So I, I also want to recognize that it's not just that it's not just feeling a certain way or that's not just in your head. It is physically there. There are some biological reasons why you're feeling the way you do. And it is understandable. Some people, you know, come to me and they, they say, oh my gosh, like, I don't know why I'm depressed. I should be feeling optimistic. Why am I not as optimistic as I should be? And what I like to do for them and for myself is say, let's think about what this situation is and what the appropriate reaction would be. Because to me, being in pain or being fatigued to the point of not being able to do something, right. feeling depressed and sad and not being motivated or angry or fearful, that seems like an appropriate reaction to me for feeling the way that I do. And so, you know, I don't want to put this like stigma on being depressed because I think it's totally understandable what we go through to feel that way. It's just, what do we do with that? Do we need, you know, additional support through a therapist or psychiatrist or to come to a group? Do I just need to go, you know, for a walk, talk to a friend, do some kind of art therapy or some kind of therapeutic activity? So I think knowing yourself is really what's important and acknowledging um, when that is really becoming an issue in your life. But I do want to validate that it's totally normal to feel that way, given what we're experiencing. And definitely, I'm, definitely I'll, I'll say something about sometimes, you know, there's times that you do need to be alone or just away from everything just to recharge mm -hmm. and then continue. So not necessarily is being depressed. So that's how that's what I do a lot of the times when I know that I know my body and I understand when I'm not doing well so a lot of the times just staying away or are being alone helps me to recharge and to continue mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes and I just want to add one thing you know from a caregiver perspective it's always good to let us know, um, your let your loved ones know, your caregivers know, hey, this is what helps me. So it's okay if I'm in the room, you know, I just want peace and quiet, or I just want to be left alone. Because a lot of the times, you know, they may not understand what, what makes you feel better is to be alone. So sharing that with them, I think would be very beneficial to both of you, because then they will not be nagging you or asking you or worrying about you or frustrating you even more, where all they had to do is just leave you alone. And I just want to say it's okay to not be okay. And it's okay to validate those feelings and say, you know what, this is good for me. And this is what makes me feel better. And this is what I need right now. So, um, you know, the, these are, I mean, everything that you guys said is, is great advice. And I do think a lot of this has to do with us learning from each other and then empathizing with one another, you know, when we're open in these support groups, because everything, even though we do host them virtually, everything stays in the group. And I think that's one of the best things that we can offer is just being ourselves and supporting one another. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a great segue, Estella, to the next question of what can you expect from um, a support group? What can a person expect for from their first time attending a support group? You know, I, I think with every support group, it's different, right? So it's kind of like a beautiful red dress could be displayed for the four of us. And we could say, wow, that's such a beautiful dress, right? But we also have to keep in mind that it might not be the right shape for my body. It might not make me feel sexy. It might not make me feel good. So you have to try out sometimes different support groups. Um, so what to expect is kind of like you can come in with so many expectations and think this is going to be the best support group for you, 
I may not be the right fit for you. So I think going in with um, not too many expectations and just going in and trying it out and saying, you know what, this is the first time I'm here. I'm going to a safe space, a place where people will understand me a little bit more because they have gone through um, what I've been going through. Um, maybe they have gone through worse and they can help me. Maybe they can help me with a journey and understanding what it is really to live with lupus, um, what it is to provide support to someone that lives with lupus, what it is to take medications or what to expect when I go to see a doctor, what to expect to um, to do, you know, if I do get a certain reaction or, you know, just different tips. So I think for me, not having a big expectation and just allowing yourself to go in and share if you feel comfortable to share and also get whatever you think is going to be best for you. Remember most of these things with lupus, everyone is, is very unique, right? There's not two alike. So understanding that you're not going to get every the, the, the right answer all the time and understanding that this may not be the right fit for you and maybe another one is. So um, going with not too many expectations, I think will help you. Mm -hmm. Temper your expectations. Wana, I see you unmuted yourself. You wanted to add? No, uh, I just wanted to say that, you know, that um, just going in open-minded and um, just learning and also sharing um, and what you share might also help, might help <coughs> others as well, others in the support group. So yeah, of course, you know, just going in, listening and getting what, what you think might work for you and sharing and what you share might help somebody else. Right. And remembering while we're being philanthropic and charitable that there are brain benefits. It's a two-way relationship, both mm -hmm. giving support and receiving support. Totally. I wanted to add too that I encourage I encourage members to go to multiple groups, mm -hmm. even at the same time, because what somebody gets from my group, they might not get from another, and vice versa. So I have people in my young adult group, for example, that go to Loom School Lupus as well, or they go to another adult group because they find that they get different information. And the more information, the more informed they are, the more they feel like they have a sense of control and that they can learn more about their disease, which was kind of the point of them going to group anyway. Um, I also like to ask people in the beginning of group, especially if they're new, what brought you to group? What are you hoping to get from group? Sometimes it's like, I just want to hear, I just want to listen to see what others are experiencing. Sometimes there's a really specific question, you know, like I just got put on cell sept. What can I, what side effects can I expect? Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, I, I'm really having a hard time navigating relationships as, as a teen or young adult. Are you guys having that too? Um, what I love about group and, and I think what is so important to me about engaging with other people and I always use this example is like, if I'm in group and I say, I'm tired, mm -hmm. guess what? Everybody knows what I mean. Mm -hmm. If I tell my husband I'm tired, I've been with him for 20 years. He's going to be like, take a nap. Okay. That's not what I'm looking for. But I also can't expect that someone that doesn't have lupus is going to, to know exactly what that means for me. It's, it's not fair. And so being in a group where some of the language we use is recognized and heard the way that we want and need it to be. And we, we get that validation that we don't get in our lives. We get people who really, really understand what we're talking about and can offer support, can offer words of encouragement, can say, I got you, I appreciate you, I know what you're going through. And you can get what you want. So I always say like, take what you need. If it's concrete information, perfect. If it's just listening, perfect. If it's supporting others, that's great. And oftentimes it's really different each month too, or every support group you go to. And I feel like our members kind of get the hang of it when they start coming to a group. They're like, okay, like I know this is a safe space to talk about this. I know this is a safe space to you know, address this. I know this crowd, I kind of know how to navigate this. So again, reaching out to as many groups as possible, it's just more support in figuring out what's working best for you. There's also no pressure if a group doesn't work for you. I, you know, I love that Estella mentioned that. It's totally okay. 
and there's no expectation and that's also so nice that there's no pressure you don't have to do anything you don't have to share anything you're just there to be you with people who totally understand and that i feel like is just it's priceless it's priceless even as a facilitator to be a part of that group yeah so what i'm hearing is you know it's important to kind of um, listen to your gut and intuition and how do you feel after you've left that group and ideally you want to feel either understood better understood or more informed or both so just notice that when you're leaving this next question I'll start with Juana um, I've avoided support groups in the past because it made me focus on my pain too much or focus on my problems too much or it seemed like a complaint fest how are lupus LA support groups different? How are they different? Uh, in uh, the Looms for Lupus support group, we try not to focus so much on the negatives. Uh, we try to encourage one another. And yes, we're all going through pains and aches. And we can share if, because like uh, Liz was saying, you know, when you're in the support group, if I say I'm in pain, I'm tired, I know that the other um, patients there are gonna understand what I'm going through, but definitely just receiving that support and um, understanding each other, uh, I think that's how it's different, that just the support that we give each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, did you wanna add on to that, Estella? Yes, I think, you know, feeling validated, I think it's also very important, you know, when you go in, um, and not only are you feeling understood, but they're also this, you know, so many people go to the doctor and they look well, they look, you know, they're, it's an invisible illness. Some people don't understand that. You know, I understand a little bit more, not only because I have been around so many people living with lupus, but I also have a lot of symptoms that are similar. So it helps me understand and validate them a little bit more and understand a little bit more. So I think, you know, one thing I think that everyone um, gains is the fact that they're validated because unfortunately some people are not even validated by some of their doctors. So, right. yeah. And I wanted to, to share that um, social does not mean supportive. Mm -hmm. It's not the same. Just because you're in a group of other people who have your same illness does not mean it's a supportive environment. And when your environment is not supportive, when it is invalidating or toxic, it can actually have an inverse relationship, you know, opposite effect of all the positive benefits that we mentioned in the beginning. So keep in mind, like I love that one I said, like the the um, support groups, they will like share each other's experience like, oh, I'm in pain or I'm tired, but it's not a focus on the negative. So you want a group where there aren't like the chronic complainers or like the illness Olympics, I call it like, oh, who's the sickest? Like, oh, you got a pain there? Well, I got a pain here and there. Like, no, <laughs> it's not helpful. Um, but, and also any, any place where they try to oversimplify with solutions like, oh, well, you just take this herb and you'll be cured or, you know, just take, you know, just pray or something, you know, considering mm -hmm. that we are whole people. And so it's a whole person management, mind, body, spirits, and community. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, Liz, if you wanted to add to that. Yeah, I wanted to add, you know, one really important thing about our support groups is that they're professionally facilitated. So, we know how to, like, if someone is on the, the illness Olympics, which we all know when that happens, it's like, like, it's a one up, like, com, you know, contest, and we don't get much out of group. No one does. So what I like is that we we're professionals, we know how to do this, we've been trained in how to do this. So one thing that that's a, a piece I like is that we're part of the community, but then we also have a side of us that's trained to make sure that the group is running appropriately, that people are getting the right time and space to address their concerns, to give feedback, to provide support get, and get support. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really helpful. And I think too that our groups have also a focus on strengths, 
-hmm. And that's something that I find in our groups a lot is that someone might, you know, express a concern, but either through myself or the other group members or both, we're able to turn that into a reminder of like, you are brave, you are strong, you are empowered, you are talking the way you should as an advocate. Like we can really point out what you might be feeling as like a negative feeling or a negative characteristic about you. That might look different to somebody else who recognizes that as a you know, positive characteristic, something that's gonna help you in navigating your illness. You might just need to kind of figure out the wording or the frame of how to view that for yourself. So I think that through that professional facilitation and kind of focusing on the strengths that it makes a support group a more healthy activity to do, a more healthy way to get support. Mm -hmm. um, and I love that that's part of our community and how we view ourselves because I think that people feel so much better after they're at group because they feel like their thoughts are kind of like in the right direction, or at least they got some, some ideas on how to think differently and some, I, some different ideas about what their strengths are that they maybe came in not knowing or thinking that those were negatives about them. Absolutely. I love that. We, we had a, a couple of prepared questions that you guys have already answered actually of, can you attend more than one support group a month? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you guys have shared that there's a young adult group, a family caregivers group, Spanish speaking group. Someone asked, are there any support groups in the daytime? Yes, there are. There are actually Saturday groups as well. Um, and, you know, with COVID, one of the silver linings is that uh, most of the support groups have actually moved online. So you don't have to worry about commuting or, you know, finding a parking space and all those, you know, stressful situations. You can just log on like you have tonight. Um, another question that came in. Um, so I was diagnosed with lupus uh, fibromyalgia 10 years ago and alophasia. Um, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, recently diagnosed with arthritis. My hair is falling out. I've been seeing a dermatologist and receiving Kenalog uh, injections on my scalp, but nothing is working. My question is, has anyone experienced hair loss due to lupus? Um, I can say that I have, like my short hair, super cute. It's not due to lupus. <laughs> <laughs> it was by choice. But when I was in a flare up, my hair would come out in chunks, just lots and lots on the on the ground. And so you might speak with your physician um, or your specialist, your rheumatologist about like, am I in a flare up right now? And is that why it's happening? Or do you have a discoid lupus where you actually have sores on your scalp um, that is contributing to the hair loss? I also had hair loss. When I was first diagnosed with this, I did lose most of my hair. My hair is long now, very long, uh, but I did have, I, it took a couple of years for my hair to grow. I don't have discoid lupus, but I did have a lot of, uh, a lot of rashes on my scalp. The scalp, the, the rashes and went away and my hair started growing a little, little by little, and now my hair is long, but I did do a lot of natural herbs and but it doesn't work for everyone we're all different um i did a lot of um the massaging on my scalp so i think the flow of the blood and that helped me um but i don't know if it can help everyone but i mean uh, my hair was so short and i love long hair so for me it was important to do everything and try everything i never tried any medication or medicated shampoos i just did natural herbs and a lot of massaging on my scalp, but um, it worked for me or either it worked for me or I'm not in remission, but um, I was in uh, with the medication that was kind of stable. So that could also be a reason why my hair started growing back. Liz, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I noticed for sure um, when I'm in a flare, my hair comes out in chunks. Um, when I met my husband, I had a glorified mullet, so I can attest to, you can find a man. <laughs> um, and so I feel like, as is my lupus, there's so many ups and downs. And I know that that's so scary. 
but I have to remind myself that it's come back or there's something that I have been able to do with my hair to make it work um, or shave it. I mean, when I was, when I was in college, I had um, really heavy cytoxan treatments. And so my hair almost completely fell out. When I had cytoxan treatment last year, it didn't. So I think there's a lot of different variables. It could be stress, it could be the, the health of the skin on your scalp, like we said, you know, something like a rash or discoid lupus, it could be stress. There's so many different things that affect, um, you know, our body um, and our hair, I think reflects a lot of that. Um, but it's been something that is, is sort of part of the lupus journey where I have to be ready for the unknown. Um, but it doesn't mean I'm not hurt or angry or feel upset about it. Um, and don't let anybody tell you that you shouldn't be upset about it. Um, mm -hmm. That's what I had a lot from people in my support system that didn't have lupus who would say, you know, it's just hair. Oh, what, you know, it's just hair. It's going to grow back. Well, a group where someone may have experienced that before maybe could have said, I hear you. Yeah. It is hair, but it is hard to look cute. It is hard for your self-esteem. I felt that challenge too. Yeah. So I feel like because of my community, I was better able to manage it emotionally. And then through, you know, just kind of wait it out as my hair grew back. I have, you know, longer hair now, um, but I've had boy cuts in the past or, you know, have worn a wig in the past or extensions. Um, and it really changes, um, as does, you know, other physical characteristics, unfortunately, but it is something where validation honestly has been the, mess, the best medicine for me. So we have two minutes officially on the clock. However, we have two additional um, questions that I'd like us to address, and then I'd like us to close with sharing um, how people can join a support group and the contact information for each of our panelists. So if you guys who are tuning in don't mind, we are going to go a few minutes over. So someone asked, um, is it true that if you are thin versus overweight, your inflammation will decrease? Um, I can answer that as a, um, a psychology professional, not a medical professional, but what it shows is that obesity, you know, um, activates certain um, enzymes that is associated with inflammation. However, it is not like I'm, I'm thin and I have super high levels of inflammation and protein spilling out of my urine and everything else. It is not a one-on-one, -on -one. just losing weight is not going to decrease your inflammation level. Keep in mind that we are whole people and our bodies are so complex. And the reasons why we have inflammation are so complex that has so much more to do with just, are you thin or are you heavy? So please take away that, that self um, fat shaming, you know, and things like that, that are so prevalent in our society, because you can be, you know, overweight by BMI standards and run three marathons, run circles around someone who's thinner. So keep in mind your whole health, including other um, factors that impact inflammation, including your disease activity from your lupus and um, gut health, meaning, um, you know, are you eating a pro-inflammatory diet or an anti-inflammatory diet and so many other factors. Um, Estelle, I see you nodding a lot. Did you want to add to that? Yes, you know, that's, you know, the hair and the weight, like for me, those are two things, you know, that you hear a lot about. It's, and it, people think about it like, well, it's the way you look, you know, it's all vanity. and no, it isn't. Uh, and sometimes, you know, even people shame others are you're, you're causing this upon yourself. And no, that's not happening. So I think that's why it's so important, you know, to connect with people that understand and are going through similar situations, because I've lost my hair too. Um, I don't have lupus, but I've lost it because of stress. And because of long, you know, long haul COVID and COVID. So it's in, and fibromyalgia. So it's very, very important to not go into judgment right away. So that I did want to just emphasize. And you're right, just because of the way you look does not mean that you are, um, you know, causing or contributing to your inflammation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There's, there's a question that said, 
um, how do you avoid being a vampire, not being an, a vampire? And um, to clarify, she said, that means being photosensitive and feeling like you have to stay inside away from the sun. Um, I just wanna jump on that because that was really important to me. Um, so one of the Lupus LA conferences uh, several years ago had expert rheumatologists from around the globe who were there. And when what they showed is that, you know, what the research shows is that um, the amount of sun exposure that you would get from a, a person with lupus would get from the time that they leave the car to walk to the, the front door of a store is enough for certain lupus patients to increase, and in, we're talking about inflammation, increase inflammation, increase disease activity that is seen up to three weeks later in the body. And these are things that aren't visible. If you're like me, immediately you feel fatigued, migraines, all this stuff, you know, but some people actually don't see it, but it shows up in labs. Um, so what do you do? Um, there are, um, sunscreens that you can use, including those that are good for um, darker tones, brown skin, so you don't look like a <laughs> walking corpse. Um, and I'll put a link in the chat. Um, and then there are also sun protective clothing, UPF rated clothing. And Lupus LA offers grants for uh, need-based grants per person, $500 twice a year per person that you can use towards getting that sun protective clothing or UV shielding on your car um, windows and those kinds of extra protections. But uh, what else did you guys wanna share about that? Um, I was like, saying, oh, sorry, go ahead, Juana. Go ahead. No, you go ahead, Liz. Um, go ahead I was you. just saying um, one thing that I um, started using was a product called SunGuard and there's many other products out there um, that are similar, and you actually wash your clothes in the sun guard. It's like a detergent, or you add it to your detergent. Um, and so it allows you to basically add SPF to your clothing. Um, I also have SPF um, clothing. So when I'm wearing, uh, like I sweat a lot from my steroids. So it's hard to wear like a long sleeve shirt all the time. But if I'm wearing a long sleeve shirt that has SPF in it, that's lighter, it works so great for me. So I don't feel like I'm like showing my, my steroid sweat to everybody. It's a way that I can kind of like adapt to my outfit. Um, I too, if I'm in the sun and that was actually one of the, one of the I think ways that my lupus kind of showed itself the most, I mentioned I was a competitive swimmer. So I was out in the sun all of the time and sunscreen at the time, honestly, wasn't that cool. And now it's like, sunscreen's being talked about all the time about like that's part of your routine and that's exactly what I did was make it part of my routine find products that I liked to use that my rheumatologist that I would like literally bring um you know a sunscreen to my rheumatologist and say does this have everything that it would need to have to protect me um and she would give me feedback on that so you know that is definitely something that um I think many of us have really struggled with and what I remind myself is that, is that when you get a sunburn, it's actually an immune response of your, your skin trying to heal itself. And so for some people, it doesn't really affect them as much. For me, that's when my body goes on overdrive and it says, I have to heal the sun that hurt, your, hurt my skin. I have to heal it. So my immune system that's already on overdrive, that's already like crazy, is now going extra crazy and therefore affecting my body. So it's kind of ways that I can reframe that experience that makes me more motivated to check out products or you know be more mindful of the sun. Um, I also I work in a hospital. There's there's um, fluorescent lights everywhere. I was able to get an accommodation of having the fluorescent lights in my office. I have my own office. I was able to get them changed to a lower tone. Um, and so that might be something that you inquire about at your workplace. Um, so there's different ways that you can find accommodations to that. Um, but I think it's about, again, that's a great thing to bring to a support group. Like what products are you using? Can you give me links? What are things that maybe didn't work for you? That's a great, you know, concrete thing you can come out of a support group with this brand new tool. I think you said it all, Liz, uh, as far as the fluorescent lights or just spending, uh, uh, 
two minutes walking from my car to the door of my office is enough time to get a flare. I mean, driving, uh, driving or just driving, I have to always use something protecting, protecting me from the sun. There's times where if I am driving and the sun is hitting my chest and I don't have the protective clothing, it gets to the point where it's, it gets very hard for me to breathe. So definitely just wearing protective clothing and making sure, like you said, Liz, about the, the uh, fluorescent lights, I do also have that sens sensitivity. So I do have to make sure that I uh, get the accommodations or I don't have fluorescent lights at home because that will definitely give me a flare. And I, I'm always, and I always talk about how a flare can literally change your life and um, just trying your best to, to do what you can do to protect yourself. So definitely. Yes, and a lot of those, um, those products or the clothing is very expensive. So do consider, you know, there's a lot of, uh, um, a, there are a lot of brands, but there are some that are really great, but they're pricey. So do consider these scholarships, you know, and applying Lupus LA besides, all having these amazing support groups and having this amazing information and symposiums to gain more knowledge about living with lupus and supporting, you know, just different um, ways to supporting by education, by awareness, you know, it's utilize that, utilize this information because a lot of times people choose not to purchase like a product because they can't afford it know that there's help out there. And I think that's the one thing that us in, you know, in Lupus LA a family, we're a family here and we like to uh, be able to share these amazing tips with everyone. So, you know, for me to see Juana go from feeling great to a minute later being exposed to the sun to not, um, you know, she covers herself in little, you know, uh, wrapping, she wraps her body, she tries to do as much as you can. And that does not mean you have to stay indoors all the time, you right. can go outside. So try and just um, not go during the that, that middle of the day, you could go either early in the morning, or late in the evening or later out later out uh, in the evening. So, you know, try and see what works for you, and what makes you feel good. Yeah, thank you for sharing the, the hours of the day. So the UV index, um, at least you know, in our, our time zone is um, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. is when the UV index, the UV rays are actually what's harmful for us with lupus. That's when it's the highest. So go out before 10 a.m., go out after 4 p.m., have a stroll on the beach at sunset. It's more romantic anyway, you know, so we have some benefits, you know, there's, there's less people on the hiking trail at 8 a.m. versus yeah. 10 a.m. It's better for us. Um, so I just wanted to let folks know that you can reach out to Lupus LA, lupusla.org, and please do consider um, Lupus LA support groups um, to get more support. And if we can please just have um, each panelist how to connect with you and with your support group. So I think um, everything is, is at the Lupus LA site. So there are links there. You have the Zoom information. Um, if you want to specifically reach out to us directly, you know, loomsforlupus.org or on social media, um, we're, we're everywhere. But we are, all the information, I think it's listed under lupusla.org. Mm -hmm. Yep, I echo that. I echo that. Um, you can find us on lupusla.org. You can call Lupus LA and talk to Maggie or one of the Lupus LA staff who can maybe help navigate which, which group might be best for you based on age or language or something you're looking for. Um, so, you know, ask the questions. Ask those questions ahead of time to make sure that you connect with a group that's a good fit for you. That's what we're here for is to support you. And, and we want you to be successful in that. Um, and just a reminder, the young adult group is new. Um, and so if you know anybody in that age group, I think it's a perfect, um, perfect time to jump on that and make sure that that our young adults have both adult groups and groups that, um, you know, are are more relevant to their their age group or more specific to their age group. Um, it's great to get the perspective from the larger groups, but it's also really nice to get the validation from the age, the age specific group. So to close out, I just want to remind everyone of, of maybe one of our take home points that you are not alone. 
And no matter where you are in your lupus journey, there are benefits to joining a support group. It's a two-way relationship, you know, with the benefits to our brain and to our medical health and our mental health. So show up for yourself and show up for others and join a Lupus LA support group. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you to all of our attendees who took the time tonight to join us. Um, yeah, reach out to me. I put some links in the chat for our Facebook uh, page, as well as our main website. Um, give me a call anytime. Would love to hear from you and offer any additional support that we can. And thank you again, Dr. Blyde and Liz and Estella and Juana. Thank you so much for taking the time and uh, look forward to seeing you all very soon. Take care, have a great night. Bye everybody. Bye.